Hitler is on the brink of doing what Napoleon failed to do, conquer Russia. For the Russian people, the war is an unbroken agony of siege and defeat. In Leningrad alone, 350,000 civilians die of starvation. Russia reels and calls on her allies for help. Open a second front, cry the Russians, hoping to divert the German divisions at the gates of Leningrad, of Moscow, of Sevastopol, of Stalingrad. The German guns keep pounding. Russian appeal comes in a black hour. Everywhere there is victory for the Axis. Nowhere can the democracies do more than hold their own. Action, bold, decisive action can no longer be delayed. Roosevelt and Churchill must strike. But where? How? The statesmen of democracy ponder the issues and decide. Invasion, a second front. The orders go out to America, to England. The transatlantic planning begins. Target, top secret. In England, General Eisenhower, newly appointed American commander for Europe, directs the overall strategy. The United States has been at war only a few months, and her means as yet are limited. The Marines on Guadalcanal need all they can get. But the pressure of events is inexorable. The Allies cannot wait, and time will not wait. embark at English ports for the first joint Anglo-American offensive in World War II. The troops do not know their mission. They do not know that they are one prong of a sweeping double thrust at the Axis in North Africa. The secret course is south, into the Mediterranean. assault is hurriedly forged at East Coast forts, where untried and untested troops, fresh from civilian life, are brought together for the greatest amphibious operation yet attempted. 4,000 miles of hostile sea lie between the crystal sands of Virginia, the granite rocks of Maine, and the far shore of North Africa. Many of the men have never heard of their destination, Casablanca, on French Morocco's west coast. Most of the troops have never been to sea before, and half the young sailors of the convoy are sailing the ocean for the first time. The Allies hope to trump some Axis tricks in a bold move which skeptics call premature. The chances of success are rated no better than 50-50. circulate that the ships are headed south for maneuvers. But Task Force 34 is in deadly earnest. The operation is christened the Torch, 
And on these men and ships falls the job of lighting the torch and keeping it burning. From America, from England, 650 ships and the two convoys plod their precarious way, converging slowly on the whole northwest corner of Africa, moving jointly toward the target, zigzagging past the submarine packs by day, steaming straight by night. The ships make the longest voyage ever ventured by an amphibious force. Get the soldiers across the vast and perilous sea safely. Land them on the barren and uncertain beaches safely. That is the sailor's job. Sailors on watch are charged with the safety of the ships, the bravest of responsibilities. But in the transports, the troops have little to do except relax, fool around, wait, and try to forget what is ahead. crush Germany and thereby help Russia, they must first wrest bases from France, a friend. The French Vichy government in Europe has pledged itself to defend its African colonies against all. But whether the French will resist Americans, how violently they will react, none can say. So the friendly convoy must sneak toward shore like an enemy. <laughs> of High Barbary. Beyond lies Africa. President Roosevelt announces the landings to the French by radio and asks their help. Then General Eisenhower urges the French to turn their searchlights skyward as a token of welcome. All hands hope and pray there will be no resistance.
H hour comes in the hazy dawn of November 8, 1942. The troops go ashore, still uncertain whether they will be welcomed or resisted, embraced or shot. Lights are deceptive. The lights are hostile, not friendly. The French are confused. They have not heard the Allied broadcasts, and military leaders loyal to the Vichy government decide to fight. proceeds as planned, and the troops head for shore on either side of Casablanca, the target. And lying at anchor in the harbor of Casablanca, more trouble, ships of the French Navy. <laughs> continues for three bitter days before the Vichy French surrender and the free French and their American allies take over. sent to negotiate with the French is trapped in Casablanca. This, says the general who heads the delegation, is the worst setback to German arms since 1918. slips through the Straits of Gibraltar and steams eastward for Oran and Algiers. In Oran, there are vital airfields and an important road network. 
Algiers is the economic, political, and military center of the entire area. If the convoy can survive the Mediterranean gauntlet of submarines and bombers, all of Northwest Africa will fall into Allied hands in one swift stroke. are the first major Allied victory in the war against the Axis. Three days after the first troops touch the beaches, French North Africa is a fighting ally. The French themselves are now free to join the march against the common enemy. seaports, the Allies begin the enormous buildup of supplies in preparation for the ultimate conquest of all North Africa. General Montgomery and his 8th British Army are lashing Marshal Rommel and his fleeing Africa Corps 1,200 miles to the east. In the west, the Allies must make ready for a drive into the desert to catch Rommel in his flight and squeeze him to death. The campaign that began as an amphibious assault becomes a grinding struggle for supplies. Suez is shattered, but 
the Nazis still have a firm grip on North Africa. They will not let go. Into Tunisia, across the Mediterranean narrows from Sicily, the Axis High Command sends streams of transport planes to reinforce Rommel. Swiftly, efficiently, the Axis begins its own build-up to counter the Allies. pushing Rommel from both ends, from the east, from the west, and they keep pushing him, and pounding him, and pushing him. <laughs> Shows the first furrows of defeat. 
It is not yet the beginning of the end, but it is the end of the beginning.